Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Appalachian Roundup. This is episode 8, actually. And today we're going to talk about homelessness in Appalachia and why the numbers of people who don't have a home every night in Appalachia keep going up. What are the causes and what is the relationship between economics and elected officials? Basically, I would argue economics play a major role and uh, elect official, elected officials are doing little uh, that's useful and a lot of times making the problem worse. Stay with me. I want to hit directly head on this this criticism that often encounter that basically goes something like this. You know that guy down there, exit 19, who panhandles. You know that guy. He he drives a Cadillac and he lives in a brick house, maybe a mansion, and he has thousands of dollars in his pocket. That guy is a liar, a scammer, a druggie, a whatever. And so therefore, we should not help the homeless. I mean, that, that's basically the logic and the type of argument that you that you hear. That I think that's mostly bullshit. You know. It's not to say that there aren't scammers. Absolutely, there are probably scammers and all sorts of things amongst the community of homeless people out in the United States. But there are scammers everywhere. You know, when I think scammer, I think televangelist. There's a scammer. Think of uh, Pfizer. There's a scamming corporation. I think of a lot of things that are scammers, and yet they're there. Um, and I think they're generally a small chunk of what's there. And that there are a group of people who are homeless uh, for a combination of reasons that are not their own choosing. It's not simply because they're trying to scam. They're not wealthy. A lot of times the people who are homeless are kids and very vulnerable women suffering domestic abuse and other things. So I just want to directly address that criticism. On that note, let's look at the news. You know, what brought my attention to this issue is a Blue Ridge Public Radio article that highlighted how between 2020 and 2022 in rural America, they focused on Oregon and Appalachia, but in rural America, that homelessness rose by 6% in that two-year span of time. And that's a, that's a large number. Uh, and it's also visible to me traveling through eastern Kentucky, coming to Virginia, which is my primary area in, in Appalachia right now. Um, you know, I see the signs of homelessness, both in terms of small tent encampments out sometimes n near a creek or something like that. So it is much more visible now. My experience is sort of corresponding with what and what I'm reading here and so it always makes me start thinking and connecting up with other things that are going on and asking why. The article talks about different solutions to the problem of homelessness that are kind of emerging locally in places like Oregon and Kentucky. I'll talk about the Kentucky example. Um, the article highlights that in Perry County in eastern Kentucky that a survey shows that there are, on any given night, there are roughly 40 people who are unhoused in the county. Now you think that 40 people may not be that big of a number, but with a county of like 30,000 people, 40 people every single night who more or less can't find housing, that's pretty significant. And, you know, in terms of do you collectively want to respond to it. I mean, I think we should. An organization called the Kentucky River Community Care Organization, which was started under John F. Kennedy under that administration with some federal money, focused primarily on behavioral health, but they have more recently started providing housing this, under this notion of like housing first, which I'll come back to later on. But housing first is this idea that, you know, before you can deal with things like behavioral health, you got to be housed. And so under that kind of philosophy, it aims to get people in affordable housing. In the article, they cover a couple of different examples highlighting how this is paid out, particularly in terms of an example they look at a woman who faced domestic abuse and uh, the deaths of certain members of her family who she relied on, and this basically put her out living in a tent, and now she has an affordable house to live in through this organization. Multiple counties in eastern Kentucky work together to help fund this project to deal with the homeless population in eastern Kentucky, which is, as I'm going to highlight, is pretty significant compared to a lot of uh, Appalachia, but it's pretty significant in all of Appalachia. Research in the Kentucky League of Cities in 2022 showed that eastern Kentucky had a significant problem with uh, homelessness. Harlan, Letcher, Perry counties are all in Appalachia and they all face from some serious problems here. And we're looking like over a thousand kids, for example, in these counties uh, on any given night who cannot guarantee where they're gonna sleep. I mean, here we're talking about kids. Came the floods in Eastern Kentucky in 2022 and this basically made everything worse in terms of homelessness. You know, first of all, it killed 44 people. This was covered in every major newspaper's organization in the country covered this flood. I went through there about three days after it happened. I'd never seen anything like it. I just remember being in the river in the North Fork of the Kentucky River and there used to be like 
five or six properties there, all probably a single family in this, you know, area right in the bend of the river, and all of that had been washed out. You know, that's that's probably like five or six houses and it all just gone. And, uh, you know, and I've been traveling back and forth over the course of time, and these people are coming back, or they're trying to, and, you know, they're living in FEMA trailers. I still see the FEMA trailers there, okay? So that tells you that this issue of homelessness, trying to reestablish a more established, stable home is is clearly still a problem there. This Washington Post article in particular focuses on all the various agencies, FEMA, as well as like private uh, and public charitable organizations that have been there to help. But the article continually comes back to this problem that enough has not been done because again, over here are people still living in FEMA trailers uh, coming on a year after the disaster. Um, and so the article keeps coming back to that. Even uh, President Biden went there, and again, the article comes back. Biden made all these promises, and yet here are these people still in this trailer. And so it seems that neither political party, state or federal level, state and federal level, are doing much uh, or taking this seriously enough to deal with the issue of homelessness after this disaster. Great documentary that came out. It's available on YouTube. You can watch it. It's called When the Water Goes Down. Uh, if you search that, you, when the water goes down, it's about the Kentucky floods, and it's a very good documentary, maybe 20 minutes long. Uh, highly recommend it, and it kind of gives you a sense of what people lost, how they suffered. And so we have this problem in at Appalachia where homelessness is a growing problem, it seems. Uh, it's not only in eastern Kentucky. I've been highlighting eastern Kentucky, especially the disaster, you know, made everything worse. Um, but, you know, places like Abingdon, Virginia, here much closer where I'm at, or Marion, Virginia, or Bristol, Virginia, Bristol, Tennessee, they're all complaining about homelessness. Bluefield, West Virginia is complaining about homelessness as a crisis, and so is Abingdon. And so it seems that homelessness is not some, something simply reserved for disasters, but it seems to be a thing, a problem across the entire region. And of course, I know living in Chicago that it's a damn problem there. So I don't think think it is simply an influx of scammers, and again, that's why this is a bullshit kind of story, that there's something larger at play here to create this pattern of homelessness that's so widespread, but also so localized in a place like Appalachia and Abingdon, Virginia. You know, why? why? What's causing this problem of homelessness? Why in Perry County, Kentucky, on any given night are 40 people who can't find a house to sleep in. Why on any given night in eastern Kentucky, even before the disaster, are there are a thousand kids in some of these counties who can't guarantee a place that they're going to sleep? What's driving some of this? I think a lot of this is economic and political, of course. But I think largely if we look at other countries like, say, Japan, which has the lowest rate of homelessness in the world, uh, they haven't achieved that rate through laissez-faire free market policies. They directly intervene to correct the problem. And so the idea that too much government interference is occurring, I find again to be kind of a bullshit solution. The problem, I think, is economic and political here. And what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. How we choose to spend our money collectively on various problems matters to the problem itself. And so, for example, if we have a problem of homelessness in eastern Kentucky, which we do, there's a great uh, New York Times op-ed uh, that addresses this very issue written by a professor of sociology at uh, in, in Kentucky and a PhD student at, I think, Princeton University. Um, but it's basically where they're talking, highlighting how much money is being spent on the issue of uh, prison cells versus, uh, you know, affordable housing. You can also look over at the Daily Yonder and see... Um, a great podcast uh, and also article. Other politicians like uh, Representative Andy Barr from Kentucky and Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, they have, in one way or another, worked to undermine or started to undermine the Housing First program, which is a federal program aimed to put people in houses first and then deal with things like addiction or whatever. Caught really strong traction under George W. Bush and was institutionalized in various presidencies afterward. Uh, but the point is, and, and I, I'm not advocating for the program, I mean, I, again, like I'm looking at the level of homelessness and I see that housing first isn't necessarily the solution or it's not effectively working or maybe it's underfunded or I'm not sure, but I don't think it's like addressing the problem in an adequate way. The bigger issue for me is that these guys are attacking this program while doing nothing to actually, to offer some sort of serious alternative. I mean, the guy that 
supports J.D. Vance and his kind of view is that economics is not even involved in, in homelessness, which I think based on all the research is I would consider it a joke. Uh, but that's nonetheless the kind of like intellectual insight that's that's being generated over. So that's the situation. So we have like elected officials making things worse and certainly not solving any problems in this regard. I mean, this is kind of like political neglect at the highest order. Uh, you know, there's plenty of evidence to tell us that prisons don't solve homelessness and offering no solution doesn't ho solve homelessness and certainly putting more barriers up to homes doesn't make it easier to access homes. I mean, I don't see any of that really working and that's the solutions our politicians are offering or at least at least the conservative politicians at this point. I mean, this is who's actually talking about this. Again, who, what are the Democrats saying? I don't see Joe Biden swung through Kentucky, and that's about that. So the point is, I want to reiterate here, is that homelessness in Appalachia is a problem for adults and kids, and it's primarily a problem uh, caused by economics and political negligence, I would say. You know, but what it comes down to ultimately is something like this. Rents are too high, people are too poor, and politicians neglect their community's actual needs in favor of grand federal investment projects, or they may even just make it harder to access housing federal programs.